Normally, I'm not drawn to space operas because they tend to lean into the military realm far too much for my liking. But this one fell into my lap. It was a request for a read-along book club. So on that note, if you'd like to hear my very extensive thoughts, chapter by chapter in a four-part series, check out the card up in the corner. But this one was surprising. It wasn't centered around military whatsoever. And there is a lot of controversy surrounding this book, which I'll talk about in the review. You don't hear much about it though anymore, I guess because this was published in 1991. Everybody has cooled their jets or do not even know this thing exists. And Stephen R. Donaldson, it's a name I hadn't heard since the days of Thomas Covenant. I remember a good friend of mine was really into those books when I was in junior high. But before we begin with a review, what is the hook? What is the real story about? A man named Angus Thermopylae, a space pirate and known murderer, enters a space station bar called Mallory's with a beautiful woman on his arm and people take notice. This anomaly is complicated when another dashing man enters named Nick Socorso. The tension between the two men erupts into violence that has a story far different than the patron's guest. A real story. So what did I think? Well, let us begin with character. And the beauty of this book is the character dynamics. I always talk about character dynamics because in a lot of books, you'll notice that there'll be a lot of characters, specifically fantasy, even sci-fi often, especially space operas. However, here we only have these three main characters and they serve very specific roles. And those roles, well, I won't spoil it for you, but change slightly over time. We have Angus, the very disgusting frog-like man. Even Donaldson describes him as frog-like at least twice, toad-like at least once. He's overweight, he's disgusting, he embodies what he is, and that is the villain. He starts out as the villain of the story. He's an ore pirate, he's a murderer, and we do get to witness this murder, as well as far worse things. He's a very traumatized individual, so at least Donaldson is giving us the tools to empathize with this man, even though we most likely will not agree with what he does in this book. And on that note, does his trauma justify his actions? Of course it doesn't, but I'm so glad Donaldson actually gave us a reason. It's a very immature and a very short-sighted reason, but often trauma affects us in a way where we don't think logically. But he is not only traumatized, he deals out trauma to this woman named Morn Highland. She's a cop. He finds her. He kidnaps her. But she is a troubled individual herself. She's done some very bad things, things that she is somewhat aware of. However, it's not completely her fault. But her background as a cop builds into Angus's trauma. As you can see, we have a connection. We have a dynamic. And she's extremely interesting in this because even though she is the victim much of the time, she has power over Angus. Even though she has the inability to disobey him, more on that when I talk about the plot, there's this wall, there's this tension, there's this power that she has over him, even though he technically has power over her. And she developed in a most fascinating way to me. There are moments in this book where you're not sure if she's playing with Angus or if she's truly acting in this way. Because on one hand, her reactions feel like they're on the surface, that they're far too obvious, but then toward the end, she kind of admits as much that she truly was quote unquote broken, but I'm still not sure even after finishing the book. I'm, I'm thinking I'm leaning into more that she was affected instead of putting up this facade. But what is a story of a villain and a victim without of course, a hero, Nick Socorso. He's a dashing or pirate. He's got a cool ship. He's got cool hair. He's got a beautiful face. Well, handsome's probably a better word. And he swaggers into Mallory's and he wants something. He wants more. He wants this beautiful woman that is on Angus's arm. We do notice scars on his face though. And those scars lead to, again, a traumatic past, which has created the man he has become. We do get a detailed look at his past, but I feel like he's the least developed character out of the three. For most of the book, you're definitely sticking with Morn and Angus. The characterization is great because, again, the dynamics, how they play off each other, how they represent different archetypes. But they're not just archetypes because there is deeper stuff happening there. And there is a transformation. Yes, a transformation, which I don't want to spoil. I would absolutely love to talk to you about it. It's something that I really missed. I think I internalized it, meaning I felt it, but I couldn't articulate it. Donaldson describes this technique or his intention in the afterword of the book, which is probably the longest, most detailed afterword of any novel I've ever read. So I highly recommend you read the afterword if you decide to read this novel. Let us talk about the plot next. And this is an extremely simple plot because we're only dealing with three characters. Most of the time we're only dealing with two. We start in the bar on this space station of sorts called Mallory's. And the great thing about this book, one of my favorite things about this book is the POV of the first two chapters. I'll talk about this more in the writing section, but just know it's from the point of view of the patrons in this bar, almost as if they are the reader 
What do I mean by that? Well, they're hypothesizing about this situation. We have a very toad-like ugly man with a beautiful woman on his arm, and it just doesn't make sense. And we see Nick Sicorso, the dashing pirate, off to the side, and we're wondering, what is he thinking about? When is he going to act? And so the reason why it's called the real story, it's almost like Rashomon, where the patrons are hypothesizing about where these individuals came from, what they're going to do next, and where they're going. And the last line of the chapter, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, is something like, but that wasn't the real story. Then we get the real story. We start with Angus. He's going through space. He's he's decimating people. Absolutely horrible person until he stumbles upon Morn Highland. Her ship is actually chasing his until a disaster hits. And then he takes advantage of the situation, boards the ship, wreaks havoc, takes her into his possession, keyword being possession, and finds out she has what's called a zone implant. It's this thing in her head that prevents against gap sickness or aids in dampening gap sickness, which is a condition that kind of drives you mad uh, when you travel to the far reaches of space. And Angus has the remote. He has the remote control so he can have her do whatever he wishes. And well, his wishes are very, very dark indeed. And they're repeated and they're repeated and they're repeated in a very violent manner. Let's just say he violates her over and over and over again. Which brings us to the controversy. All of these one-star reviews on Goodreads we're criticizing this book for its violence, but there's a point. There's something they're missing. What is the point here? Well, the point is this action of violation we know, psychologically anyway, is about power. It's about control. It's about having power and control over the individual. And what does Angus have? He literally has a remote control, the ability to control this woman. So I'm sure you can see subtextually what Donaldson is playing with here. So this is not him having a fantasy. At least I don't think so. I don't know the guy. Yes, this could all be bullshit to make excuses for uh, what he wrote. But if you read the afterward, he states that he sat on this novel for like two years because he was worried what people would think of him. They would think that he was Angus Thermopylae. He was this disgusting individual individual that he was writing. So again, could this all be bullshit? Could he be a dirty bastard? Yes, of course. But I don't think so. I don't think so. You can tell that he wanted to explore these themes, no matter how dark they are, which I think is worth doing. You have books like Lolita. You have books like American Psycho. You have films like Irreversible. And I think Irreversible is a great example. If you haven't seen it, there's there's a scene with Monica Bellucci's character. And it's I think it's like a nine or 10 minute scene. No cuts locked camera of her being violated just the way Morn is in this book. You may argue that's gratuitous, but I think that's the entire point. It's to make you uncomfortable as the reader. It's to show you this ugliness. It's to remind us that there are terrible people out there doing terrible things all the time. And while I'm not arguing that this subject matter is for everyone to read about, I feel like criticizing it is completely unfair. That's a really cool movie, by the way. I highly recommend it if you haven't seen it because the whole thing is shot chronologically in reverse. So we start at the very, very brutal climax of the film and work our way back to the beginning. And it's really too bad that so many people gave up on this book once they hit this activity because there's some really interesting things going on from a character standpoint, from dynamics, with the themes he's playing with. It's funny, if you read some of these one-star reviews, you'll see ones that say you have this really disgusting man, he's got a remote control that allows him to control a woman in any way he wants. And I'm thinking, that's the point. That's the point. Because from a character standpoint, he wants to be able to control her without the remote control. But that's his crutch. He's forced to use it and it endlessly frustrates him. He admits he's a coward numerous times. And despite the fact that he has literal control over this woman with a device, she has control over him, which is illustrated at the very end of the book. So again, it's funny how these people are literally pointing out what this book was trying to explore without even realizing it. Part of me gets it to a degree because again, if you look at the cover of this book, it feels like any other space opera. It doesn't feel like it's trying to explore deep characters or deep themes or anything like that. But definitely when you read the afterword, you'll know that Donaldson is not treating this as a light read, not whatsoever. But where does Nick come in? What does he do? Well, he's our hero, right? He's supposed to save the day and he, he kind of does. I don't want to spoil it for you because uh, the way this plot unfolds was not only engaging, but it was clever. And I think even if you didn't like this book, you have to respect it from a storycraft standpoint because in these 200 pages, Donaldson was doing a lot. So the plot moves quickly, if you can get through the subject matter, of course. I can't say there was ever a dull moment in this book. I was never slogging through the text, wondering when the chapter was going to end, wondering when this arc was going to end. It really piqued my interest. I, I, I picked up all of the other books in the series, so I'm going to dig into those at some point very soon. So let's talk about the writing itself, or as I like to call it, the cinematography of the novel. So this, on the surface, this book, is very plainly written. It's very, very readable. Sometimes to a fault, there's some dialogue in here that's a little bit cheesy. There's some lines that I felt could have been rewritten to fit the tone a little bit more, but you never find yourself stumbling through sentences. But there's two main things that stood out to me. 
The first one I'll give credit to Lee Hunts because he coined this term in our read along. I'll also link his, uh, his review down in the description below. But there's a POV in the first two chapters and maybe later chapters, I can't quite remember, that he called third person plural. Remember when I was talking about the patrons in Mallory's bar being our POV? a collective POV, well, that is what it was. And it was such a cool experience. I've never read a book like this using this technique. And what was great about it is it was almost like the patrons were a link with us as the reader because they see these figures come in, something's not right, something doesn't add up, and they're constantly hypothesizing about what's going to happen. As we do as readers, right? As we're watching something we don't have knowledge about, we tend to hypothesize. We, we try to guess where the story is going to go next. And that's exactly what happens here. So not only is it an interesting technique from a writing standpoint, it's incredibly cinematic and it creates this really cool link between <laughs> this group of people, it's this group of these nameless people and the reader. And it was kind of confusing at first because it, it feels a little bit like omniscient POV, this godlike I spying down on all of the events that are unfolding in the book. But once you start reading a little bit more deeply, you can see what he's doing here. You can see that it's actually all of these people talking amongst themselves, trying to figure out what is going to go on. But mind you, there's no dialogue. It's not like you have a collection of voices spouting off all of these ideas. This is all done through narrative prose, which brings me to the next thing. I think I've seen this somewhere else in the book. What was cool about it though, it was a great way to speed along an exchange. So there's parts of this book, and I'll try to put some stuff up on the screen here, where it's, it's like a normal dialogue exchange without the quotation marks, right? Without the punctuation, without the he said, she said stuff. But you immediately know it's a conversation. You can hear it in your head. But because it doesn't have all the punctuation, because it doesn't have all these action beats that we are accustomed to, it gives it this almost like montage quality. It's, re it's really cool. And it happens numerous times in this book. And I guess I should talk about one more thing about the writing, and that's uh, one of my favorite things, and that's called white space. If you don't know what white space is, it's when you take advantage of the rhythm of a scene, of a pace of a scene. So normally people think that a paragraph is just a singular topic. And once you finish with that singular topic, you move on to a new paragraph. I feel like a lot of writers out there feel that same way because I can't tell you how many books I read with just fat paragraph after fat paragraph after fat paragraph. Donaldson exploits this technique beautifully. He uses fragments, single words, new lines to create a visual flow. So you might have a fat paragraph and then a short line, a fragment or even a single word, almost as if these words are, are dripping down the page, right? They're leading your eye, they're creating a rhythm, they're creating a pace. This is something I do not see enough in writing and I feel like it makes it so, so cinematic. And so it was great to see that here as well. So yes, the writing is simple on the surface, but it demonstrates some innovative techniques that mark Donaldson as a craftsman, which is why I'm going to give the Real Story by Stephen R. Donaldson, eight out of 10. A story of trauma, control, and revenge explored through effective characterization, unafraid, absolutely unafraid to go to some very, very dark places with a plot that flows nicely and writing while it feels very simple on the surface is doing some innovative things, which makes this book extremely readable. I highly recommend this book, but it's not for everybody. It covers some very, very dark material. And so if you are sensitive to that, you have been warned. Well, that is it for the review. I hope you enjoyed it. If you've read the real story, I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments below. And if you would like to check out my own work, my own novels, check out the link in the description. Thanks for hanging out with me. Thanks for watching. And I will see you in the next one.